Golden. Okay, good evening, everyone. Sorry for the slight delay. I'm Mary Zaidi, and welcome to your active hybrid conference, part of the presidency debate series supported by Microsoft and the Confederation of Industry of the Czech Republic. Now, today we're going to be discussing a digital Europe in a globalized world, how to reconcile Europe's digital ambitions with its transatlantic agenda. So those are two very massive things. So panelists, I hope you are caffeinated. Um, a big welcome, of course, to everyone who is joining us here in person and also to everyone who is joining online. And as always, if you have a question or a comment, please do put it into our Slido chat page and I'll be picking out some of those questions or comments later on in the program. So to grow economies, we need two very distinct things nowadays. Um, we need innovation and we need digitalization. And it's something that perhaps we became more keenly aware of during the pandemic. And we also realized that Europe had a lag and that it needed things fixing ASAP. Now, if you look at stats on global digital competitiveness, it puts obviously the US right at the top of the tree. Um, China, in fact, sits just below the top 10 underneath the UK. So the UK actually doing something right for a change. Um, and then Nordic countries um, and the Netherlands are also top performers. But in key industries um, between the US and EU companies, there's close to 20 points difference. Now, the EU, of course, has legislative levers to realize its digital ambitions. You have the Digital Markets Act, you have the Digital Services Act, you also have Cybersecurity Acts. It's also rebuilding um, trust across the pond in trade, um, in investment, and of course, digitalization via the TTC, um, the EU-US Trade and Technology Council. And this, of course, this transatlantic relationship is so important because it accounts for about half of the world's GDP and about a third of world trade flows. So the EU is definitely making the right noises, but it keeps also getting itself stuck between two competing aims, between protectionism and innovation. And we saw also the EU fall back on protectionism during the pandemic and then obviously because of the war in Ukraine, which is understandable. So how then can the EU strike the right balance between being a rule maker and being a superpower in a digital space to compete with China and the US? Well, let's ask the experts. But before we do, um, we now have a quick statement from Microsoft. So please uh, join me on the stage, um, Jeff Bullwinkle. Well, thank you very much uh, for those remarks. And it's uh, my pleasure to be able to welcome people to this hybrid uh, debate of the presidency uh, in the context of Czech uh, uh, presidency here uh, of the European Council. And it's our pleasure at Microsoft, by the way, to be able to host this event in close coordination with Czech Confederation of Industries as well. It's been a very interesting series over the course of time now. And I think this uh, is a very timely conversation indeed for the reasons pointed out a moment ago. The last year or so uh, has been so challenging for so many different ways. We have the ongoing pandemic and, of course, more recently, uh, a war raging in Ukraine. And I think these things do emphasize a number of different things that are important to reflect on as we get started today in the conversation. One is the fact that technology does touch our lives in so many ways, both professionally and personally. I think also the recognition that there is a need for new kinds of regulation of technology today to be very clear. And I need also for companies like Microsoft and others to be doing their part to help create trust in technology as well and to make sure we are addressing important considerations, including around national sovereignty, which today, of course, is uh, talked about in the context of digital sovereignty as well. But how best to do that? Well, I think the war does illustrate that uh, sovereignty debates have evolved in interesting kinds of ways. I mean, think about, in fact, the fact that the Ukraine government embraced cloud services and achieved sovereignty by migrating its own data outside its borders to data centers across the whole of Europe. And uh, in that broader context, we have also an emphasis on a new transatlantic collaboration like we haven't seen in many, many years before. So indeed, it is a very good time for this conversation. We have fantastic panelists here to share their thoughts uh, with all of you, with all of us. I'm very happy to be here for Microsoft to say welcome and thank you for coming. Okay, thank you so much, Jeff. Okay, then we'll time to introduce our panelists then. Um, we have Marek Havra, who's the Deputy Minister for European Affairs at the Government of the Czech Republic. Thank you so much. I think you're on your phone. <laughs> we have Thibaut Kleiner, who's the Director of Policy Strategy and Outreach at EG Connect. Welcome. Um, we have Michael Petricek, who's the Chief Technology Officer at Avast. 
um, who joins us remotely. So you can see him just behind us. Thank you for joining us as well. We have Jose Ignacio Torreblanca, who's the head of ECFR Madrid, a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, who also joins um, remotely. And last but never least, we have Milena Yapkova, who's the vice president of the Confederation of Czech Industry for Digital Economy and Education. So welcome to you all. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all with us. Um, and let me now let all of you uh, introduce yourselves to the audience. So Marek, if you'd like to go first. Thank you very much. It's really great to be here. Thank you very much for organizing this event and, 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 and making it exactly on these two topics, uh, transatlantic cooperation and digital. Both of these topics are very high uh, in terms of the priorities of the Czech presidency. So let me just make a few remarks on the beginning as, 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 as is this format. Well, I, I think if you want to sec ensure security and prosperity, we need to take a fresh look on the transatlantic relationships. We need to create a common space uh, where innovation and investment will thrive by respecting our values. This is very important, and I think we will get to it in, in much more detail, hopefully. The Russian aggression against Ukraine profoundly confirmed the need uh, for the cooperation among democracies. The same is true regarding developments in China. China uses technology for surveillance and control of society, which is just simply incompatible with our values. At the same time, China is heavily investing into all types of technologies, going from chips uh, to artificial intelligence. And at the same time, China is intensively working on to influence the multilateral order basically to make sure that the definition of human rights stays with the country, is not a challenge in the international, in the, global, in the global setting. At the recent ITU, International Telecoms Union, uh, plenipotentiary, I think we've been very successful as democracies, especially the cooperation between the US and the, in the, and the EU. And we managed to get new leadership of the ITU, as well, we managed to let the Russians out of the door, basically, in terms of the leadership. And the China, I think, got a very clear message. When you look at the, at the number of votes from, from, the global, from the global constituency, they got the message, I think. In order to make a way forward, I think it's crucial that we strive to establish a completely new type of cooperation, but not only between the two blocks, if you wish, but between the business and the governments of the two blocks. And I think this is in, in, the, in the core uh, of the future. We need to overcome the traditional approach to, I don't want to say rent seeking, but I would say trying to secure the comparative advantage, which often leads to the race to the bottom. And we just need purity to overcome this. We need much more strategic type of cooperation between businesses and the both governments, if you wish, but I would enlarge it to the governments of the democratic countries. And this needs to, of course, stay into account both hardware and software when we talk about digital. I think the, the US National Security Council for AI could serve as kind of an inspiration. I'm not saying that we need to copy that, but maybe we need to learn a little bit uh, from the approaches which have been developed there uh, over the recent years. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, over to Michael, please go ahead. Hello, everybody. So thank you, thank you very much. By the way, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Just show your <laughs> figure. Okay, very good. So thanks the organizers uh, for kind of doing that and I'm looking for a great debate and for questions. Uh, let me just uh, share with you kind of two thoughts on the topic of transatlantic cooperation and digital and kind of follow up to what Marek just started. So I'm here as a member of the uh, executive leadership team out of Avast, which is uh, the biggest European cybersecurity firm, by far the biggest. And uh, we became recently uh, combined together with the Northern Lifelock, which is the sixth biggest uh, cybersecurity firm worldwide. And um, 
uh, we are jointly creating a, a business that is a truly transatlantic. So dual headquarters, business headquarters in the US, technology headquarters in Prague, kind of business experience and kind of corporate government from the United States, technology backend and the security engines from Prague Czech Republic. Uh, it's going to be new new name, right? So company is going to be listed on NASDAQ. But this is a truly uh, trans transatlantic business with uh, the reach to more than a half a billion of users worldwide. And you know why, why this is such an exciting uh, opportunity? It's because it is kind of centered around the whole concept of consumer uh, safe, uh, centered digital safety. Digital uh, safety centered around, around people. And the reason why we are so passionate about people is the fact that we see that the classical cybersecurity is is kind of losing its its charm because the software systems and the devices that used to be a target of the attackers are less attractive. And currently, it is the human cognition and human focus and human attention and human decision making which is a vulnerability, which is a part of the supply chain, and it's it is a subject of the of the attack, and. Uh, that's this is this is why I I think that the human perspective and uh, protection of digital freedom on the internet that this is something where the U.S. and the EU and the European countries really share the foundational set of values and you know, I find this kind of really really a a, a shared shared objective and uh, the good foundational reason why why to kind of build a transatlantic company. Um, it is not only for the ransomware and, and uh, scan protection and the phishing protection, but it's also about misinformation and about manipulation, which are the next generation of the cognitive attacks that are really important for the way how people live digitally. It's very important for people, digital, uh, digital safety. And what we, what we are focused on and uh, what is one of our prime concerns is to create a cyber safety more engaging for users. So the time when people do not need to worry about cyber security is gone. Now we're going to need collaboration of people. Second, it's uh, protection against all, all different scams and, and, and phishing attacks. But more importantly, it is protection against misinformation, which is a scam 2.0, and also protection against algorithmic manipulation. Because what we see currently is that the internet is unsecure from the perspective of users, not only from the illegitimate, uh, illegitimate attackers but also from people who run legitimate business. And this is because of the algorithmic manipulation that is driving people's behavior on the internet. So our, our aim, our goal is to be there for the users and try to provide a technological support for understanding the recommenders that are driving people's behavior online and for providing users with a true control over how recommender systems are influencing people's lives. It has been disclosed recently by Mozilla that you know, in their study with 25,000 users of YouTube, that they feel that they don't have any control over the recommendation systems that are providing uh, users consent from YouTube. And we fully understand that in order to pro protect users online against algorithmic manipulation, nobody can do this alone. And this is an opportunity for, for an academic sector, for the scientists. It's an opportunity for the technological companies like uh, Avast, Northern LifeLock, but also regulators to cooperate, to collaborate, and to come up with a regu regulatory solution that would enable proper protection of users' interests online. 
Okay, thank you so much for highlighting um, how you protect users and the vulnerability that there is online. Um, over now to Thibaut Kleiner. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks also for inviting me. Um, uh, as sometimes I have to explain what I'm doing, you know, I, I explain that working for the European Commission is like working for the government of Europe. And it's interesting because, you know, the, the European Union, first and foremost, used to be a market. It's the biggest market, biggest single market in the world. And the EU used to be also, uh, first and foremost, a trading partner. It's yeah. the largest uh, trading bloc worldwide. And I think through these uh, market-based tools, basically, we've done pretty fine over the last 15 years. Uh, I think our industrial capacities overall, uh, you know, remained relatively uh, strong compared to China and compared to the relative decline that took place in the US. We didn't do as well, maybe, uh, in the digital sector, but still, you know, we, we have been able to develop some, some technology and capacities. What happened, however, in the last five years is that this paradigm has slowly changed. And I think we've seen it very clearly with the COVID, but already before there were signs that uh, globalization, as we knew it, uh, was not anymore uh, going to stay uh, as a matter for us to gain more growth and more prosperity, but that we needed to move from just being a market to being an economic power. Mm. Because the name of the game today is much more about geopolitics. It's much more about, you know, safe, safe being sustainable yourself, you know, not totally autonomous, but at least uh, having some sovereignty in terms of your technologies, in terms of access to raw materials and the like. And these new games means that uh, somehow the, the EU and the US have to rebuild their uh, ability to work together, not as competitors, mm -hmm. but as allies, because we have challenges, not only in terms of geopolitics. I mean, just look at what uh, was discussed in, in China last week. You know, a clear challenge to the West was expressed, but also look at what Russia is doing. Who would have imagined that a war would be there in Europe uh, in 2022? And we have also to look at what is happening in the global south, where actually the West is losing ground. You know, when you, you speak to African countries, to South America, South Asia, you see that our values uh, are not taken for granted, that our help is not necessarily uh, seen as uh, a gift that is uh, really beneficial. And therefore, we need to rebuild a vision for the digital transformation and for the global influence of, of the West that is based on a new partnership. And that's why I think that the, the TTC, the Trade and Technology Council, is an interesting formula. But we have also to make it work, because if, the, the, if it's only a one-way traffic where, you know, uh, Europe and U.S. Uh, get together more closely in terms of geopolitics, but uh, the trade angle uh, is, uh, is not met because we have things like the Inflation Reduction Act that is going to penalize very seriously uh, European uh, interest, we have a problem. It's not a partnership if it's only going one way. So at the end, uh, I think the challenge for today is not only for the EU to be better in terms of its own uh, digital sovereignty, and we have there uh, adopted, and thanks again to the Czech presidency, uh, a big program for 2030. We call it the Digital Decade Policy Program, where we set to ourselves ambitious targets in terms of uh, uh, digital objectives, in terms of inclusion, you know, uh, broadband for everyone, skills, but also in terms of infrastructures with, you know, uh, being better at, at, at cloud, edge cloud, actually, but also quantum computing, chips and the like, and also making sure that our businesses and our governments are fully digitalized. So that's our target for 2030. But I think that to be successful, we will need indeed to reach out to partners, starting with the United States. And therefore, we I look forward to the TTT3, as we call it, beginning of December, we will have... Uh, a few uh, concrete projects to announce and hopefully also where we can put balance in this transatlantic uh, relationship. Thank you so much for asking about that uh, meeting in December as well. Um, next to Jose Ignacio, please go ahead. Hello, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here with you today. Um, you know, I, at ACFR, we're a foreign policy think tank. So as, uh, as Thibault said, what we worry most is about geopolitics and foreign policy. 
This means that for us, strategic autonomy does not mean independence. It means capacity to act. It means at the maximum, you know, to be free to decide on our own and who do we work, who do we want to work with, um, how do we want to support um, like-minded countries. Uh, also, maybe at the minimum means uh, not to be coerced uh, by others in order to change our foreign policies as, as others see fit. For example, concrete questions, you know, do I have to change my policy on Taiwan because I do not have semiconductors or because my 5G networks are in the hands of um, companies who answer to other governments, not just to the markets? Uh, is my democracy subject to destabilizing attempts by third countries uh, who exploit the vulnerabilities of um, social networks and, and platforms or because they use cybersecurity attacks in order to weaken my critical infrastructures, elections, and manipulate my public opinion? Do I have to compromise on my citizens' rights uh, to privacy because I don't have the capacity to regulate companies and platforms who deal with data because I'm just too weak um, to, um, to transmit uh, our values to our policies. These are very concrete examples of what um, the strategic autonomy or tech sovereignty mean. Um, the paradox here is that for Europe, we are trying to free ourselves from the dependencies associated to fossil fuels and the fossil fuel carbon economy implied a certain geopolitical order in which Europe was very vulnerable and we still are paying uh, on this. Uh, so it would be quite a paradox that in trying or in even successfully be freeing us from the vulnerabilities and the dependencies associated to carbon economies, we would end up being dependent in our digital and green transitions of the technologies uh, produced by others and or regulated by others. So this is what we mean in terms and, and the paradox that we should try to, to avoid, not to be, not to end up being dependent on, on others, green technologies, semiconductors, cables, rare earths, whatever you want to call it. I'm, I'm positive and, uh, on, 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 on the answer to these questions that you're posing today in this panel, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. I don't think Europe faces a, a problem with potential protect protectionism. It may be probably, uh, more worrying for Europe, uh, the lack of innovations and the hurdles to innovation, but I don't really see Europe being protectionist. There is no, on all these efforts uh, in the commission is engaging on, on technology, there is not a single by Europe or by European act uh, being passed, right? So, so this is not about Europe having its technologies and excluding others uh, for uh, having those technologies or uh, having European champions at the cost of others, but it is about how to make sure that companies operating in Europe, um, but also multilaterally, we can work together with the United States and other countries in doing this, they have or they answer to um, European values and standards. And I think Microsoft is a very good case in point when we speak about how you can be an European company in terms of the regulations and the values you stand for, whereas not exactly an, an, an European champion being produced by Europe's industrial policy. So I think there are many ways out of, this, uh, uh, of these problems, and I don't quite see the dangers of protectionism as compared maybe to the risk associated to innovation. So thank you so much for this first opportunity to state my views. Thank you. Thank you so much. Then to our last speaker, Melanie, I'd like to make your you. statement. And happy to be here. Thanks for invitation. Looking forward for the debate. So let me say my few words. Uh, the Russian invasion to Ukraine, where digital business uh, became a part of the battlefield, gives us a unique opportunity to reassess the EU aspirations, goals, and objectives. There are three basic lessons we've learned from this horrid war, which may help us to adapt the EU policies to a new paradigm. And these are, uh, there is no such thing as a free dinner or free lunch. Uh, friend in need is the friend indeed, and United 
we stand and divided we all we, we fall and let me explain uh, there is no thing such as such a free lunch means that the EU cannot depend on cheap critical product and services from authoritarian regimes or let them to own or manage our critical infrastructure uh, the energy crisis uh, induced uh, by Russia's economic coercion uh, causes our communities to suffer and his heart European, uh, European business. The resilience is what we need, not sovereignty, but resilience. Second, a friend in need is the friend in need means that if someone is ready to help you when you are in crisis or in danger, uh, makes possibility that this uh, is also a good partner for business and trade. We can easily distinguish friends and foes uh, from their stance uh, uh, to Ukraine, and we can assess how fit they are for growing opportunities of partnership with the EU. And US and uh, the UK are leading the way. And third, the situation is serious. Uh, never the EU has been under such pressure. And we need partners to build our economy, our society, and our trade resilient. <clears throat> and therefore, we need to work with democratic allies to build such societies. United, we stand, and divided, we fall. Thank you so much. And I think your point there on friend or foe in the Ukraine war was very poignant as well. Um, now, before we kick, out, uh, kick off, I should say, our debate um, on digital Europe, who better, of course, to muse over the path that Europe needs to tread than one of its elected officials. Please, everyone, give a warm applause to our keynote speaker from Renew, Renew Europe. She's the vice president of the European Parliament, Dita Kharnazova. Please take the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So good evening, good afternoon, and my apologies for being a little bit late. I think the idea was that I would kick off the debate, but since you already started, so maybe I would build up on what has been already said and try to be a bridge between the panelists and also the audience. Uh, and I'm really excited to hear the debate that, that will follow the discussion. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers, Euroactive, the Confederation of the Industry and Trade of the Czech Republic, and the Microsoft to putting us together. I'm very pleased to see the high level experts panel. I'm very pleased to see a lot of Czechs. As you know, the Czechs are now running the European Union. I'm very pleased to see Milena. I think she set up the scenes. Uh, I, I see some, uh, some of her words already in my paper, so I will just uh, not repeat it, try to avoid not to repeat it. But being Czech, be, uh, coming from the same region, I think we all understand that the war in Ukraine is not just the war about Ukraine, it's uh, the war about the future of Europe, and it's the, the, the war about the future of the next world system. And it's not just about the security, it's not about the defense. And I am very pleased to see that the cooperation with the US in the security and defense field is working very well. So I think that a war in Ukraine, if something managed, is to show the unity of our transatlantic uh, agenda and to see concrete results of this cooperation. <coughs> Uh, of course, now we can celebrate more than two years with the new U.S. administration. Uh, we see some concrete results that the mood has changed, uh, but we also do remember the, the, the previous administration and uh, what kind of impact it had on our cooperation uh, between the European Union and the U.S. Uh, one, if you want to work with, with your partner, you need to build the trust. If you lose the trust, then it's very difficult to restart. Uh, 
I think we, what we have seen in our transatlantic agenda that you cannot just push one button to, to restart the agenda, that you need to rebuild the trust. And what we have seen in Europe um, due to these four last years in the US politics is uh, Europe looking more and more inwards. Europe uh, speaking about digital sovereignty, uh, about uh, autonomy. Uh, and I am the one in the European Parliament always adding the adjective, open digital sovereignty. And I think in the current context of the war in, in Ukraine, it's even more important to outline the open digital uh, sovereignty and uh, autonomy. Because I do understand the arguments of my colleagues that we want to um, build a digital sector in Europe, to have strong tech companies in Europe. Uh, but my question would be, is this the most economic or even the most secure choice for the digital uh, single market? I personally don't think so. I think that a closed European space is not the solution to our greatest challenges. For me, the challenge of the digital future is making sure that democratic values underpin it that freedom of speech, freedom of businesses, other basic rights of individuals are respected. For this, we need to ensure that it's not China who is setting up the rules. It's not China uh, that is the source of new technology. But I don't think that Europe alone, or perhaps even United States alone, will be able to meet the challenges. I'm happy that we have a tool with uh, the US to tackle these challenges together, the Trade uh, uh, and Technology Council, where we started to talk, we started to see what we can deliver together. I just hope that we will have some concrete deliverables uh, during the December, uh, during the December uh, meeting. Of course, um, speaking here, the key issue, and I'm sure that it will be one of the issues of the discussion, is uh, the data flows. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to see that uh, President Biden, Biden uh, signed the executive order recently, which allows us uh, to have uh, more optimism. Uh, but we've been through it already before. We uh, already had uh, the uh, privacy shield, safe harbor, and all of them were challenged in the court. So I'm sure that the new, new arrangement will be also uh, challenged uh, in the courts. Uh, I think here uh, the, our American colleagues uh, should understand that the damage of uh, uh, blocking data flows to the economy far outweighs the potential value of the intelligence gathering on those flows. Uh, this is not the only way to gain national uh, intelligence. The greatest source of intelligence would be a strong and increased daily exchange of information between American and European intelligence agencies. But for this, again, what we need is the trust. But I would say that uh, no matter the result of the core challenges, we should not or we must not give up. We must not give up on finding a way to maintain data flows and to prevent de facto localization requirements on both sides of the Atlantic. I've been in the digital agenda in Brussels for, for over eight years now, uh, and I'm proud what we as the Europeans have managed so far in the digital agenda, how we are, are determined to uh, create the digital single market in Europe. But every time, every time we discuss new legislation on digital in the European Parliament, what I have on my mind is that this is not the rules that will govern just the European companies, just European citizens, but it's something which will affect also the other side of the Atlantic. And hopefully, if we manage to sit down together and set up these standards together, then we can have in mind the fact that we are setting up the rules for the rest of the world, 
that we are setting up the global standards and rules. So thank you very much for inviting me today for this timely discussion and looking forward to, to your, your discussion and the outputs of, uh, of today's panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, one thank you so much, Vice President, Madam Vice President. Um, okay, well, let's kick off this debate then. Um, so let's just quickly do a temperature check. Um, going, looking at all the keywords that all the panelists have used, I pulled out a few. Policy, paradox, geopolitics, friend, division, sovereignty, influence. Um, the EU wants, of course, the EU plots. But is it really shaping the right rules right now to get the digital future it wants? How much time... Or how long could this possibly take? Uh, Marek, I'll come to you first. Yeah, maybe I, I, I start with the word joint. And, and this will be the core of, 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 my, of, my, uh, of, my, uh, of my talk now. And I very much follow what the, the Vice President of the EP just said. Um, I think we really need something what I would call joint strategic autonomy of democracies, so going wider. Uh, than, 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 than transatlantic. Well, let me maybe just remind you very briefly what are the priorities of the Czech presidency in, in very quick shortcut. It is Ukraine, energy, European defense, resilience of democratic institutions in Europe, and the resilience of the EU's economy. It's the resilience of the EU's economy. This is the heading which we have adopted as, 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 as a priority. So I'm really, really glad to hear some echoing of this. Uh, even I would say not only from the Czech business side, but as well from Jose, because the, the capability to act is to act in order to be resilient in, 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 in my understanding. And for all this, uh, we really need to go ahead with this joint approach. TPC is a great starter, but we really need to go much, much deeper. And what is crucial about that, and this is why we already organized one of the events to support the TTC, is to involve the businesses. Joint evaluation framework for artificial intelligence, perfect. But we need the businesses to be sitting around the table. Joint work on, on standardization, perfect. But again, business is crucial here. If these standards are not taken on by the business, if they're not co-created by the business, they will not get very far. This is exactly why we kind of been losing ITU for the last eight years, because the businesses from this part of the world, from the democratic part of the world, didn't see the value of engagement. So we emptied the space, both the governments as well the businesses, and we led the space for Tencent, Huawei, and the Chinese government. So this is exactly what we need to tackle, and this needs to be needs to be understood. And the final is, what I would like to, to, to talk about is, is joint space for R&D, because I fully share with, with, with Jose that there is a huge danger, that as we start to, to try to protect our values, we will actually just do not manage to have, to be in the part of the world which is able to innovate. And there I would very much advocate for a joint space for R&D, really large scale. Not the US, not the EU, but joint. And, and basically with the conditions which we have in Horizon, where we have three member states as a rule of thumb, we need the condition of the two member states, the US and the EU. I'm, I'm a little bit exaggerating. Oh, OK. Um, thank you very much. Um, so, Thibaut, coming to you next, you heard what the Deputy Minister said. You've also heard what the, uh, the Vice President talked about, you know, Ukraine, the war, how much has this war reminded the EU um, or wanted or pushed it forward in terms of its digital ambitions and security? I think the war in Ukraine was not really anticipated, which was probably a big mistake. But at the same time, I think it is not only a wake up call, it is also something that obliges us to be better at cybersecurity, I think was just mentioned. And, and I would just recall that uh, there were attacks uh, somehow, or not only in Ukraine, but indirectly also on infrastructures in the EU. And we managed to avoid 
big problems because somehow we had already started to prepare ourselves through, uh, you know, not only just legislation, but joining forces between EU member states in terms of having capabilities, in terms of having also the means to build this resilience. And I must say that I, I like the term resilience. I think it's a good way to also show where we stand today. But Ukraine is, is more than this. It's also about uh, our values and it's also about uh, the vision of where our society should go in terms of uh, also the digital transformation uh, and also the, the power. I mean, very interesting. We were working with Ukraine uh, some years ago and we had interesting projects in terms of supporting e-government, uh, which led to this app they have, you know, on mm. their smartphone. And without this, I mean, the situation would have been much worse, actually, for Ukrainian citizens who left everything behind, just uh, you know, fleeing to uh, uh, neighboring countries. Because through this um, app on their phone, they, they, they had sometimes the means to identify themselves, to access their social security, to sometimes find money through the app. Mm -hmm. So it became more than just technology, it became a lifeline. And I think that's also what we learned, that uh, digital technologies can be designed not only with our values uh, in mind, they can be also designed in a way that is efficient and that makes a big difference on the ground. So I think all these are not only lessons learned, I think they are an invitation to do more and to be faster to also transform Europe in this direction. Okay, so an opportunity to do more to transfer, uh, transform Europe. Uh, Jose. Coming to you then, this idea of digital sovereignty, is it in fact a sort of redundant concept because it can never be absolute, Europe can never be fully independent? Is it better perhaps to look at strategic autonomy? I mean, the Vice President, for example, she talked about open digital sovereignty. I think, Marek, you spoke about strategic cooperation. What's your take? Yeah, as, as I said, you know, there is... Um, probably not such a thing as, as a full 100% tech sovereignty. And even if you knew how to get there, you wouldn't want it because the nature of the European project is a project which is open to the world and is multilateral in its DNA. And this has made very clear from the beginning by President von der Leyen in her attempt, of course, to combine the idea of geopolitical Europe with the idea that multilateralism is in our DNA. So, you know, we, we are ready and open, and we should be ready and open to work with whoever stands for values which are similar to those. We don't want to create or to break the internet in order to have an European way to and, 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 and exclude others. What I, what I think is very important is to highlight, um, despite uh, sometimes um, fears, uh, by, by some, that on this agenda, despite its diversity, and this is what I think it guarantees its success, is that we are 27 countries. But when you look at DSA and DAM, the Digital Service Act and the Digital Market Act, look at what happened at the European Parliament. You know, 539 votes in favor of DSA by only 54 against. And on DMA, it was 588 and only 11 against. You know, this is incredible unprecedented and i think it shows also the way and shows what are we up to it is i would say very hard to argue that the high degree of bipartisan and multi-partisan consensus in europe about these regulations uh, is setting us on a wrong path uh, to the future i would rather say that what we should be worried about is that in the us there is no bipartisan consensus on any of these issues and that we are facing an interlocutor at the other end in, in which it is adopting our legislation in some cities, states, and some uh, agencies are de facto adopting these regulations um, and, and the Democrats would want to, uh, to adopt them, but they cannot find their way. So uh, we, I, I think that, of course, as I said at the beginning, that we may have a problem with a stiff innovation, which we have to look very carefully at, but I don't think um, that, um, that we are divided on this topic, which is um, a good sign. And, uh, and even with platforms and companies, we've seen how on the code of this information, how large platforms have been voluntarily working with the EU since 2018. And there are two rounds of uh, this information 
um, code of practice exercises that have worked very well uh, without threatening the life and um, the capability and even you know the business model of these large platforms and companies. So I think we are on the on the right tra track on on regulation rather than on the wrong track on on these issues. The, the uh, issue uh, with the with the sovereignty is that it's a fluid and sometimes slippery concept because everyone sees in it what they need. And if you look into the dictionary, this this uh, concept originated 16th, 16th century in France, and it was used to bolster power of French king over feudal rebellious lord and to facilitate transition from feudalism to nationalism. And I would like to avoid a situation when some stakeholders in the EU may use this to facilitate transition from internationalism to uh, back to nationalism. So this, this scenario we should avoid. Tipo, is that something you'd like to comment on? I saw you nodding quite a lot there. No, I, I like the historical uh, references. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I, I was nodding because I was myself in a at least two debates uh, some some months ago in, in in council so where member states were debating um, th this what what word to use uh, with sovereignty uh, open strategic autonomy strategic autonomy resilience i, I think the semantics only go that far mm. uh, it, it's important but it only goes that far and i think what we we need to do is uh, to basically realize that uh, in today's world, if you don't stand, uh, you know, on your two feet, basically you're not a credible partner, and basically you're vulnerable. And I think in a situation where you know you cannot access certain components, you don't have access to certain raw materials, you don't have access to talents, you're in trouble. So you can call it whatever you want. Uh, the reality is that you need to fix this uh, in a new, new situation where globalization is not uh, what it used to be, where we would have you know, smooth and easy uh, transactions uh, across borders. And that's a little bit what also I was trying to say, that you know, we, in the EU there is this, this, uh, now this uh, situation that people realize it's not enough to be a market. You need to become more of a power that you know, has somehow also an industrial angle uh, and, and some form, uh, I would not call it patriotism, because I agree with you, it's, it has bad connotations, but at least EU business needs to stick together a bit more and not just be about, uh, you know, uh, I do business wherever uh, I can get the, the highest margins, which has been a little bit of the, the narrative over the, the past years. Well, a big power that the EU does have, um, Thibault, is its power to legislate or to regulate. Um, but one thing I did want to, and I think we spoke about it just before um, we did start the debate, it's this idea that the EU... Um, the European Commission sort of hyper-regulates, that it's a digital gatekeeper that is perhaps holding Europe back from its true potential. I mean, obviously, it is a really hard job, um, I think, for the Commission and also for policymakers in general, especially given the times, polarisation, cybersecurity, wars, economic turmoil. I mean, but talk to us a little bit about the kind of role that the European Commission has in all of this. Do you think that the European Commission does hyper-regulate or over-regulate? Is it to me? Yes, yeah. to you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's, it's a typical question from the perspective of London, if I may say. Ah, and okay. I think that uh, <laughs> if you look at uh, you know, the Brexit... I wasn't the, going down the Brexit no, but route, I'm but now you want to use that dirty it word it's, on me. Uh, it's a test case. I mean, if you look at the facts of uh, what actually uh, happens when you don't have EU regulation, you have just another form of regulation that may be actually even more costly. So I, I think that at the end of the day, the, the merit of, of uh, the, the single market is that it's, it's big. And therefore, with just one piece of regulation, you have access to uh, almost 500 million uh, consumers that are relatively wealthy. And therefore, it's a fantastic tool for uh, doing business. Uh, at the same time, I agree with you somehow that you know, we should not over-regulate because mm -hmm. there is at some point a tension you know, when you have to fill in forms or to pay attention to multiplicity of rules that are too complex. Of course, it has a cost. But in the digital space, I think the big problem of Europe is rather that we need our people to get into this digital transformation. There is a lot of risk aversion in Europe, much more than in other regions of the world. There is much more hesitation to actually adopt new technologies 
And very often, the way we have designed our legislation is to define, uh, I would say, the European vision of a digital transformation of digital technologies that are essentially good for you because you will be protected. You know, your privacy is protected because everybody is included. You know, we try to, you know, include, you know, elderly people, handicapped people, people who don't have maybe financial means and so on. We try to make sure that there is security online, you know, that children are protected, that, you know, when you uh, go on online platforms, there is freedom of speech. So all these values are in a way uh, translated into legislation and the goal is not to uh, harm business on the contrary to create this big market but also to design the technology in a way that fits the european vision the european values and that hopefully creates incentives to do the right thing and not to abuse uh, your consumer online or to create algorithm that will uh, lead to young people committing suicide uh, and so on I think you answered that um, very, very well. Uh, Michael, coming to you then. Um, there was one thing I noticed, the Cybersecurity Cloud Certification Scheme. Um, from what I understand, um, the approach is seen as restrictive. Some member states aren't happy. Um, you know, for example, that. If, it was, if that restricts competition um, from non-European companies, most, um, are we going to see that it can or cannot provide the same sort of level of cybersecurity in the EU? What would you make of that, where the EU is? Do you think, essentially, the EU is perhaps overextending itself here? Oh, would you like to... So, um, like to... Uh, no, first, uh, first, Michal, uh, if you would like to say something, but then I can jump sure. in. Sure, go ahead, okay. yeah. Yeah, you know, just kind of uh, briefly, you know, I wanted to kind of add to to sense to uh, what has been debating here, because I think that's a, that, that's a like really critical topic. And you, I like uh, what Marek has said early on, that uh, for us as Europeans, kind of being able to protect the resilience of European economy is very important. And at the same time, it, it's important to protect our values and our freedom. And I actually think that you, know, this is enabled by a tech, a technological sovereignty, but transatlantic, not not European. I think that the European technological sovereignty would go directly against the first two objective that Marek mentioned, because getting a restricted access to best-in-class technology would be hampering European business, and in the end would be having a negative impact on European. Uh, freedom. So I actually think that your uh, technological sovereignty is a, is a good good idea, but only in the context of either transatlantic or cross uh, democratic part of the world, but not European. I don't really think that it would be helpful in near term and long term for the European citizens and businesses. Where I think there is an opportunity is in creating a shared values with uh, with the partners outside of the European Union. There is a number of opportunities. I actually think that the, the, the regulation and partnership in regulation is an instance of a shared value. But I am an academic by training, and I think that kind of one of the most exciting idea is kind of fostering the R&D collaboration. And you, European Union has got the biggest and most successful R&D funding program on the planet, the Horizon programs, and I think that kind of building a Horizon EU-US or building a partnership in the context of the Horizon funding would kind of make the extra, extra mile and kind of continue building a shared value between Europe, European countries and the, and the United States. Okay. Well, over to Thank you. you. Melanie, you next. <laughs> I would like just to react on Thibault and okay. then uh, <laughs> to your question on uh, cloud uh, uh, yeah. uh, cyber security certification. Uh, <laughs> you are from directorate, which is friendly to business. Uh, not, not many harmful uh, regulation comes uh, from uh, your team. So we like you very much. Uh, concerning <laughs> concerning uh, the, the regulation in digital space, I have a slightly different uh, opinion here because, you know, we are the business, we have the skin in the game, uh, you know, we are the most impacted. And I would say it's like taming the shrew because, you know, this is a huge amount of regulation and very complex with not enough uh, thoroughly made impact assessment. And this is something we have to change. So, uh, because this can 
you know, harm European businesses and innovation much more than, you know, uh, uh, competing with some, with some giants. If I ask you, yeah. what is the innovation like in your country then? Innovation? Is it, being, is it being harmed by the regulation then? I think that if, if, you, if you don't get the regulation right, yes, definitely. We can have an example uh, with uh, suddenly in AI Act, uh, there appeared a general purpose AI system that they would be regulated as well. And this would be so difficult, so impossible to comply with. We are talking with developers, engineers, uh, small, medium, big enterprises. So this is something we should bear in mind talking about innovation. And back to your UCS, I think that's, uh, it's, it's true that uh, Inflation Redu uh, Reduction Act is, is, is uh, uh, it's, it's harmful to European business. It's shame that it was agreed in the in the in the in the in the shape it was agreed. Uh, uh, but UCS, uh, this is the similar shameful attempt, uh, protectionist attempt, and uh, and it was introduced. Uh, you know, in the clandestine way, there was not enough debate about that. There was no impact assessment because it will have some repercussion for trade. And this is just example of two files that could be debated at the TTC. And this is how we can, you know, achieve uh, concrete uh, measurable outcomes we, uh, we all call for. Marek? Yeah, I would like to a little bit build on what Thibault, <laughs> Michal, and, and, and Milena said. Um, I would like to a little bit challenge the notion that the European industry or the business needs to stick a bit more together. I think this is flawed. I think what we need really is that the industry from the free world, from democratic world, sticks together. So the US together it's European, or European together with the US and others, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand, <clears throat> stick together. And this is how we will build the strength. This is how we actually will grow, individual as well, in this partnership. And I think for this, we just need to do much, much more. One was the, the, the R&D, large program based on Horizon. So, so, so I'm, I'm glad Michael likes it as well. The other would be, EU-US Erasmus program. Just let's, let's have a large new Fulbright, uh, which would go between the EU and the US. We just need much bigger exchange. This is crucial for us, because this is how you build trust. You live in the place, and, and you gain the trust. You gain the understanding of, of, of small differences, the, the, the fundamental values we share. This is, this is no discussion about that including privacy and digital, by the way. But, uh, but there are always small differences. And, and, and by, by being exposed to them, you, you understand them better and you build the trust. So concrete, very concrete cases of cooperation between businesses, the US businesses is a good example. We're sitting here in, in Microsoft in Europe. This is a very good example. Exact. So it's, it's exactly what we need to foster, we need to promote, we need to support. Of course, respecting the values we share. And we, we might want to be stronger on that in terms of EU. And I, I fully share with Michal, I, I did my past work on, on the impacts of artificial intelligence. I fully share the, the, uh, the concerns about manipulation and the cognitive abuses, by the, by, especially by AI and digital. But it's not only the governments need to act. It's really the business. And this takes me back to the impact assessment. I, I, I worked on the impact assessment in the commission for a number of years. And I still feel the cooperation with the business just needs to be overhauled, especially under this pressure of the geopolitics we face today. It cannot be the way, which is still today, that the business comes and basically lobbies to, to, to maintain the status quo. It, it cannot be this way. It needs to be a new type of cooperation. We need to get real data from the business. We need to have a new type of agile regulation together to develop it, because exactly this is what we need. It moves much faster than we, than we normally do. This is why, for example, we're supporting in the AI Act 
the implementing part, so for the commission to act, so to be more agile. But we need the business from the other side uh, to cooperate and provide the data so we understand the impacts much better. And, and we just need to develop a new type of cooperation. And all the companies need to be involved, both from the US and, and, and Europe. Okay, Tiba, how about we build on that um, idea of um, cooperation then? Um, and how do you make sure that you know, private sectors do collaborate um, and that the EU doesn't get knocked off its path um, to be really competitive in the digital sphere? No. Collaboration with the business is, is essential. I mean, I would agree with what was said. And at the end of the day, you know, you're only as strong as your private sector in terms of competitiveness. So we need to nurture, uh, I would say, uh, European ecosystems. And especially in the digital sector, that's something we are trying to do, for instance, with the CHIPS Act. So I, I will just use this as an example. I think it's the first attempt to, to really do industrial policy in a way, because mm -hmm. this proposal contains elements around uh, research and development incentives, about uh, support for investment, but also elements about how you manage these strategic issues in terms of access to you know, uh, CHIPS for certain uh, sectors. Um, and I wish we would be a bit faster, to be honest. You know, I wish that uh, uh, Council and Parliament we would already have agreed, because uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, you know, we have a CHIPS Act. And I think having on both sides, you know, the means to act, I think would reinforce very much, you know, our abilities. And CHIPS, in the end, you know, uh, is, is the, you know, the bread and butter of, of everything digital. Uh, it's also where, uh, as you see it now, so it was Ukraine and, and, and China, we, we, we may still have a little bit of advantage that we need to nurture, and where also there are big risks, uh, you know, look at what uh, is happening in, in Taiwan. So at the end of the day, we need to develop these ecosystems, but also to make sure that we are not naive, if I may say, in terms of, uh, you know, this, this uh, cooperation, because business interests, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, are, are not uh, um, universal for the, the, the public good. I mean, it, it is, at the end of the day, you know, you need to make your money. It means you need to win competition. And even if you cooperate, I mean, you need also to accept that, you know, there will be winners and losers in the, in the business world. So that's what we need also to, to be aware that, you know, it needs to be fair play. And again, on the Inflation Reduction Act, this is not fair play when, you know, at the time where Europe is uh, having a, a, an energy crisis, uh, you get, if you move from Europe to the US, even more, uh, you know, subsidies and incentives. It is creating a big risk for industry today. And I think we need to speak about this with our American friends, because if they hurt us, sorry, we will have to react. And that's not, I think, the best uh, idea today when we are rebuilding this strong relationship. I think we need to do it together and build you know, a stronger transatlantic market. I like this idea of uh, doing more on, on research. I think that's actually part of the, of the plan we have for, for TTC, in fact. But we need also to do it in a situation where it's fair play and a fair competition. OK, and I know all the panelists are raising their hands. Um, Jose, I'll come to you first. Yeah, I, I wanted to follow up on what Thibault was saying because sometimes, you know, I see, you know, this emphasis or um, stereotype that Europe is protectionist um, and, and, um, and others are, are not. And especially in the case of the transatlantic relations, I think we have to be realistic, as Thibault said, and, and understand what are the challenges that we're facing. Because if we don't get this right, you know, we will be making mistakes. And the truth that is that when it comes to digital markets, it is the EU, the one that has been protecting the markets, protecting the markets, you know, by making sure that large companies, which uh, are not facing due or the right competition and regulation or antitrust co uh, competition regulations in, in the US for reasons that, you know, are here too long to, to deal with. But we know that American regulatory institutions have not been doing their, their job. And that therefore some of these companies have grown too large. And these companies, not European bureaucracy, are the ones that have been preventing competition and entry into the market of other players by preemptively buying um, potential challengers into the market. So I think, to be fair, it is Europe for a long time ago that has been guaranteeing that, uh, that there is competition in the markets and that there is fair play in the markets. Also, 
on fields, for example, like we see now, because of the size of these companies is so large uh, that we have not only uh, the opportunity, but the right you know, to think about what is the impact of this large platform con concentration on some of the issues. And I mentioned just one point, if it's not two, maybe two things which could be provocative enough for this is that one is Twitter. Um, is freedom of expression in Europe going to be regulated unilaterally by Elon Musk? Is this the regulator of freedom of expression in Europe? Or do we have to come in and step in and buy agreement across our countries and political forces agree on that. And second is, let's be also realistic about the challenges that we face from the fragmentation of politics in the, in the United States. And this is maybe a question also to our Czech uh, counterparts here. You know, can we imagine how the Ukraine war would have worked with Donald Trump in the White House? Do we envisage a situation in which um, Donald Trump would be banning Europeans from using US military hardware um, in order or just withdrawing NATO surveillance cap capabilities um, and, and the capacity to see and hear you know, what is going on on Ukraine. Can we, in some hypothetical scenario, have F-35s grounded um, in Europe because um, a US president like Trump would not think that you know, there should be use in these other circumstances? To defend a European airspace, you know these are very real questions. They are these are not science fiction questions anymore, and we have to be ready to deal with these questions. Thank you. So, given those questions, um, I know that you both want to see a bit Tivo coming to you. Then, what do you expect from the next TTC in in December? That meeting. What do you expect from the US side? So, I expect. I mean, basically now it's it's time to announce concrete deliverables, and I think we will have some. Yeah. Uh, it, it should happen in the U.S. The date, I think, is more or less announced, 4 and 5 um, December. Yes. It should not be too far from Washington. And I expect that uh, there will be also nice moments for the, the principals to get together and, 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 and discuss basically the same issues we are discussing right now. Um, I think there will be also discussions around uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act as well as maybe uh, other uh, regulatory efforts from, from the EU. But I also expect that uh, we will try to uh, get down to business in terms of uh, you know, taking stock of where we are, announcing uh, deliverables, but also projecting ourselves. And uh, uh, already, I think that uh, what I, I, I hope is that we will be talking about how technology can make a difference uh, in developing countries but also for, for the, the common goods. I mean, you know, this, this tech for good is something that I would like to, to see uh, coming out of this TTC. Okay. Uh, which one of you wants to go first? You want ladies first? No, no, Mar Mar Marek, go first, uh, then, please. <laughs> modestly wait. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to build on two lessons which we need to learn. One is from the Inflation Reduction Act. The other is from the CHIPS Act. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I start with the, with the first one. Now, uh, it is just clear that this should not happen. It's not about the retaliation. It's about what we do so it would not repeat and got aggravated in the future. So we need to build a new communication channels, probably. We need to build a new type of cooperation between the two, uh, between the two governments because we just didn't manage on the both sides, I would say. But it's not only the governments which need to learn. It is the business, in my view, which needs to learn. Uh, and, and that's I'm back to, to, to my initial comments. We just need to move from this classic rent-seeking influence of the government, of the business, on the governments. We just need to move from that. Because what that happens is that the business is being hurt at the end. It's not as the ecosystem, I mean, because there will be retaliation. And at the end, you get the business to being hurt. So, so, so we need much more strategic approach, from, at least from those multinationals who understand the situation, that we are under geostrategic, huge existential pressure. I understand that number of, uh, number of reps uh, and senators on the Capitol Hill just do not see that. And they will lobby for their constituencies to, to, to be able to build uh, solar panels and, and to, to build batteries and et cetera. I fully understand that. I, I, I've been there 30 years ago. I worked on, on Capitol Hill. That's clear that that happens. The same do, does happen here. Uh, but, but we need to learn from this. 
same in it to, to learn from the CHIPS Act. I think this is a dreadful experience for myself. I, 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 I've been following very closely the, the drafting of, of, of the, um, the work in the Council and, and from the very onset when the Commission started, I've been very closely following the US CHIPS Act. And what we're creating is here is the race to the bottom. This is exactly what we don't want. And it just gets me back to this rent-seeking culture in the business. We just need the business to, to learn again from this experience. We don't want to be rent see, uh, sorry, raising to the bottom in the democratic world. This will make us weaker. This is the same as, 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 as talking about that the business in the month side just needs to grow. No, it will not happen. It, it's, it's weak. Even, even, even the, the, the biggest market in the world is actually weak as we experience. This is the EU, not the US. So, so I think both the businesses and, and the governments like, need to really learn these lessons. I think we should use the upcoming TTC for in-depth discussions, how we prevent these two happening over and over, because this will be the disintegration of the relationship. And if I just may, a um, quick follow-up to what you're saying. Um, how can the Czech presidency, given the few months that you have left till the end of the year, how can you help to imagine what you're saying? Uh, as, as, as I mentioned, you know, transatlantic relationship has been very high on our agenda and got higher with Ukraine, obviously. And unfortunately, we were already expecting that this might happen because the, the time when we were preparing in the first half of the year, it was clear that the, 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 the pressure from Putin is, 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 is mounting. So <clears throat> I initiated not only this discussion with, on TTC with the support of business and many thanks to the commission and to the American representation to, to send high ranking officials for that discussion. As well, I initiated a number of discussions between the Czech presidency team draft, co-drafting now legislation and the American administration, number of agencies on the CHIPS Act one, on Data Act, on the AI Act, just to at least to understand each other, to exchange much more in detail, much more in depth in granularity, understanding what is the what are the thoughts on, on both sides. This is what we, we can do. We have done it. Uh, we are supporting number of events in the first week of, of November, and I'm very much looking, looking forward especially uh, to the event on, on the second. And as well, you know, if, if we are invited, uh, as you know, TTC is bilateral, the EU, the US, uh, the member states, including the presidency, have rather limited powers in there. Uh, I'm more than happy uh, to, and we are more than happy to, of course, support as much as we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Milena. Yeah, uh, I will uh, I will answer uh, Jose Ignacio question to the Czechs. Uh, what would happen if Trump would be in the White House? Yes, it would have been disaster. I think that uh, you know our societies, uh, the European, uh, the US, the UK, I, uh, are under hybrid uh, war attack, and some of results. I'm not politician. I can be blunt. Are results of this hybrid? Wars. But uh, my question, Jose, to you is what would happen now if you are, the United States wouldn't be helping Ukraine? Mm. Russia would already, you know, won and have another expansion, you know, uh, objective. So, um, and there is, um, uh, and to TTC. Uh, maybe, you know, guys, you could include some very proactive things, you, uh, like, you know, agreement uh, about joint investment to groundbreaking technologies, like a quantum and, you know, others. So something, you know, tangible, proactive. And I hope that you will solve the issues, uh, difficult issues, regulatory issues, like, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, Anti-Inflation Act and some attempts, uh, as we mentioned, UCS depends on uh, what is in the proposal of the, of the uh, NSA and uh, uh, other attempts, oh. you know, industrial partnership where you cannot uh, participate based not on your quality, but nationality. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Jose, I understand that you, we seem to have lost Michael, um, I understand that you also need to leave, there's a time constraint, so if you'd like to give maybe your final thoughts quickly. No, I, I mean, I think I, I've, I've, I've made all my points, and, and to, your, to your question, I think we know the answer, and we know we don't like the answer to that question, and this is what we should work 
uh, in a, as, a, as I said, in a non-competitive, in a cooperative way with the U.S., but also bearing in mind that at some point we may face situations in which we would have to act autonomously, not because it was our choice, but because it was some other's uh, choices. So I think we're basically in agreement there. And uh, I really, I want to thank you all for, for giving me the opportunity to, to be here with you. It was a great debate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just take one quick question, because um, I know obviously people have been asking questions. It's not fair not to ask their questions too. Um, Thibaut, maybe I'll ask it of you. Um, it's from Martin. He says, what is the smart target of digitalization in Europe, e.g. for 2030? How much is this going to cost the European taxpayer to achieve this target? Why does digitalization need central management at an EU level? Will not free market deliver the same or better results? So, so the, the beginning, I didn't understand which... Target. What is the, the smart target of digitalization for Europe? Um, I mean, it's there, there are many targets we need to reach. I think it's, there's not just one uh, dimension that is enough. Um, I will pick maybe a different one that uh, you, you I would have said originally, which would have been maybe connectivity as a, as a start, because that's what you need for everything. But I would put... Uh, Actually, the target we set for 2030 in terms of every European having a digital identity. Uh, so it's uh, a proposal we've made, you know, the, the idea of a digital wallet that is also your identity online, uh, because I think this is really the key to uh, include everybody uh, to, into this digital transformation and also the key to unleash a lot of uh, potential for new services. I mean, the idea that uh, you, you, you can also pick from your own wallet uh, what kind of information you share with an uh, online uh, platform or with, uh, with uh, individuals and companies is very interesting. You, know, you can say if you are 18 uh, or less uh, or more, you can say if you are a man or woman, but uh, you don't need to provide all the information that today we are, we are sharing and that, uh, as we know, uh, very often actually uh, happen uh, not to be safe uh, because there are, you know, access to this, this, this private information. So I would pick this one as a, a game changer, having all our identity uh, or digital identity. Uh, and this is not taxpayers' money uh, as such, you know, it is more like an investment. And therefore, what you gain out of it is much more than when you pay for initially. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I won't take any more of the questions. I know that we are getting a little bit um, over time now. Um, so, Milena, I'll ask you first to wrap up your sort of final thoughts or key takeaways from the discussion first. Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pleasantly surprised that uh, we agreed on main point, that we learned the lessons from uh, the war and from the geopolitical shift, and that we have to work, you know, in partnership with strategic democratic allies. And this is the change business land as well, hard way. Thank you so much. And happy to work uh, <laughs> with the, with, as a business, not rent seeking, but constructive with, uh, with our governments and the, the commission. Of course, it's a very important relationship um, for businesses. Um, Thibaut, your final thoughts? I think we didn't say much about media, but I think that uh, a debate like today, I think is very important. And I think that uh, online media or you know traditional media uh, are extremely important. So I think we should also thank Euroactive and support Euroactive for what you are doing. Also because we saw what disinformation can do. And I think that it's only now that we realize how important the Russian disinformation has been in our societies and how and much successful. actually it is successful still today. Uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, talking about vaccines, it was talking about other things. Today it's about, uh, you know, spreading uh, lies about what is happening in Ukraine. So I think this is uh, every day that we need to fight for free press and, uh, you know, free public opinions and, and the ability to have debates uh, that are based on facts. Thank you so much. A final words to our Deputy Minister. Well, maybe I just pick on the disinformation first. Uh, uh, I, I met the foreign minister or deputy foreign minister of, of one country, and, and she mentioned to me, we didn't have any problems with anti-vaxxers. And I asked, you know, well, tell me a little bit more. And then it turns out that they had only two types of vaccines, Sinovac and Sputnik. Mm. <laughs> cool. <laughs> you can make your own conclusions. Uh, so it is very important. It's a huge impact across millions uh, in terms of population. Uh, 
But I think crucial here is for us to, to really to use the momentum, really not to waste the momentum uh, we have in terms of the pressure under which we got. We need this to be understand, understood across the Union, uh, from the East, where it is, I think, quite well understood, uh, to the West and to the South. So, so, so it needs to be the same way understood in, 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 in Madrid and, uh, and, and, and Lisbon and, uh, and Rome. But it goes for the US as well. It needs to be understood across the US, not only in DC, but it needs to be understood across the US because the constituency, uh, the voters uh, come from the whole uh, of, 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 of the United States. And I think we should really use upcoming TTC to try to not to be angry to each other, uh, but try to understand what happened, why, why this happens, and, and how we could really prevent it in the future. And, and really start a new stage of the cooperation. With the TTC, we have a great kind of like a <clears throat> uh, run in the front, uh, and, and we should just use that as well. Okay, thank you so much. Well, listen, look, there's not much more I can add to that. Um, and we are running late, so I will just say thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to everyone who has participated, our keynote speakers, and thank you to all of you in the audience. I hope you enjoyed this debate. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. <laughs>